Hi, welcome to Wellness. I'm your host, Linda Lonigan, Senior Clinical Nutritionist. I'm here to show you the very best your community has to offer in health, fitness, well-being, amazing events, and great people. I'm here joined by Rick Bloom, Certified Financial Planner. Thank you, Rick, for My being pleasure. here. So you do so much for the community and just who you are, Rick. How did it all get started to be a Certified Financial Planner? Well, uh, a long time ago, when I was in another business, I sort of got into this business by accident because there was a recession in the early 90s. And at a time when most of the people I knew in business were you know, complaining or just saying business is slow, it could be better. I had one friend out on Long Island who was, when I asked him that question, how's business? He said, I couldn't be busier. So that sort of caught my attention. He was in the insurance business. Um, at that time, I thought that's kind of a boring business to think about, but I said, I got to look into that because I was really uh, a little frustrated coming from a business where I had established really uh, solid relationships. Uh, and then my best clients as an executive recruiter uh, would say, Rick, we'd love to hire your person, but we just laid off 2,000 people this morning. Oh. So uh, a change was in order, and I looked into this business, and that's how that I started with a disability insurance carrier called Paul Revere. Uh, a few years later, I uh, had developed some significant clientele, and they started asking me, can you help me with uh, my investments? So I, being a smart guy, went out and got a securities license in 1996. And then a few years after that, I decided I wanted to do more for my clients than just get product. So I became a CFP, which the main difference is you focus on the planning, right. all sorts of planning, retirement planning, planning right. for children's college, uh, estate planning for older clients, um, tax planning, benefits planning, 401k uh, rollovers. Uh, so I got that training, and uh, it's hard for me to say it, but it's my 28th year. Wow. <laughs> and it's, wow. Uh, I will say that um, from my uh, narrow view of it sounding like a boring kind of career, it's been fascinating mm -hmm. and interesting because uh, mm -hmm. in broad-based financial planning, you meet with all kinds of situations from someone who's saving with their children's college to business owners who need to uh, get insurance on each other or uh, want to have a qualified plan for their employees and themselves to save for their retirement and right. see so a lot of different situations right. and uh, and so here I am 2019 still going strong um, with that and I and, and I have taken a focus um, the last four or five years retirement income uh, planning where as I get older, my clients, interestingly enough, we all age the same pace. So mm -hmm. it becomes more and more important for my clients who are in their mm -hmm. 50s and 60s, to, mm -hmm. even though they're not retired, to think about what am I going to do when I get retired and right. so on. <clears throat> right. And you know, you're, you're very humble because you, you help so many and you change lives. I always say business wealth is business health. So in, in the, the present climate of what's going on, in our world mm -hmm. and our country. What do you think are the most important tips in terms of investment or financing? Well, what comes to mind is uh, we all lived through the dot-com bubble in 2002 and uh, the uh, real estate bubble in 2008. And people like to refer to those as, as crises because the stock market took a hit and uh, people sort of remember that. Mm -hmm. But there is a looming crisis, but it's a, list, a little more less obvious uh, I call it a retirement crisis because the baby boomers are retiring now and f following generations are going to be retiring. Um, and most people do what I call micromanage their retirement. They're, they're intelligent. They hear their employer or their friends or their accountants say, you know, save for your retirement, put money in the 401k and so on. Um, but they don't really think a whole lot about what do I need? What will I be able to live on when I'm retired? And another thing that's changed in our society is 30, 40 years ago, you worked 20, 30 years at a company and you got a very nice pension and it was, you're guaranteed this money as long as you live. And around the late 80s, most of these companies switched to 401ks, 403bs, 457s, which really puts the um, responsibility of investment on the employee, not uh -huh. the employer. Right. The employer just has to say, 
put your money in there. Maybe we'll give you a match. Some do, some don't. Right. And we hope it grows into a big pile of money so right. that you can live on it. Um, most people don't know how to manage that money. Right. And most of my clients, people I run into, look at a large sum of money. And obviously, it's a lot of money, but they don't really understand what does that mean? What, what can I safely take out each month Right. to live on and have fun and do all the things I want to do in my retirement. Right. Um, whether it's $100,000, $300,000, $800,000. I mean, right. some uh, some people, they accumulate a lot in their 401k, but they don't really know what's a safe amount to take out. Obviously, if you have $800,000 in a 401k and you spend $150,000 a year, it's not going to last very long. Right. So uh, people have the blinders on, as I, I say, they... They, uh, husbands and wives may talk to each other and say, yeah, I'm saving in my 401k. You're saving your 401k. You know, uh, I got that small pension. Hopefully it will be all right. And they don't really think a whole lot about what's going to happen, which, and for some people obviously are fortunate and uh, their retirement works out. But a lot of people, um, they don't really have what they need. And their decision at that point is, I need more money or I need to mm -hmm. sp spend less. And uh, that's why often you'll see people who uh, are working in uh, uh, supermarkets or uh, Costco or mm -hmm. uh, uh, Walmarts um, mm -hmm. for minimum wage, right. uh, which is fine if you like that and want to do something with the time. But a lot of these people need to make the money. It's right. really their plan wasn't to be doing that when they were older. Their plan was to do traveling and visit the right. grandchildren and right really enjoy life. So I right. think it's a looming crisis, even though it doesn't get a whole lot of attention in the uh, general media. So for my clients, yeah, I counsel them. Let's figure out what you're going to need. Let's not just talk about that lump sum, which looks fantastic. Sure. But what does it mean? What are you going to spend? How much are you, do you think you're going to need? Let's Absolutely. adjust for inflation um, right. and uh, calculate what we call a, a safe withdrawal rate. Mm -hmm. Um, in the 1990s, the safe withdrawal rate by some experts on Wall Street was determined to be 4%, meaning um, if you whatever your asset was, take 4% of that, and it should last you 30 years or so. So if you're right. 65, it should last until you're 95. Right. And because of the low interest rate uh, climate for many, many years, mm -hmm. a lot of experts have said, you know, that's got to be revisited. We really should be looking at a three and a half, three percent. Some of the really conservative experts say two and a half. So um, right. that could change, but you right. really have to figure out what's a safe withdrawal rate. And right. then uh, if you have a budget that I want to live on 80 grand a year and you only have 60, you either have to make another 20 or right. spend less. Right. Which is and, very valuable today. I appreciate you sharing that with my viewers because it is true. If you have a lump sum, I say, I have this great lump sum. But if you're not careful or have the right expertise in terms of what percentage you can actually withdraw per month and still live uh, with this right. is so valuable. And we always focus uh, where I work on, because uh, everyone likes to focus on rate of return. What's my rate of return? Yeah, you can be really smart investing my money. What kind of rate can I expect? Uh, the biggest problem really is what we call the savings rate because as a society, right. we're lousy savers in the United States. We're getting a little better, right. but we generally advise people to save 20% of their earnings. Right. And uh, that's not always easy, especially in the Northeast with the high cost of living. So, um, But one wasn't built in a day, so you don't have to go from 1% to 20%. If you're saving only 1% and you realize I got to do more, right. you can go to 3 or 5%. Right. Um, you'll never regret it because I have yet to have a client say to me, Rick, I have too much money. I, I overdid it. I shouldn't have saved this much money. <laughs> um, and uh, also, I will. Uh, it's not really a tip, but the a lot of the younger people that I work with, they're very astute about the need to prepare and plan for their retirement, even in their 20s and 30s. As I remember myself, I was not lackadaisical, but I was more relaxed. When I was in my 40s, I said, hey, I could I could lose it all and I still have plenty of time to make it back. But younger people today, I think, are a little smarter about it. They may be a little concerned, although I don't think it's a big concern. Will, will uh, Social Security uh, be able to pay me like 
prior generations. Right. I better start saving now, right. uh, which is a good thing because, uh, sure. you know, when I got into the business, they said um, someone who sa- saves $2,000 a year when they're 18, by the time they're 28, if they stop, of course, 2000 was what you were allowed back in the day for an IRA contribution. Sure. Um, uh, to, exp- to, to explain the time value of money would say uh, that person over eight years uh, or 10 years saved uh, $20,000 mm-hmm. and then it earns, you know, an average of 6%. When they're 65, they have like a huge sum, like a half a million dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And if they waited till they're 28 to start, they would have to save for the next 37 years and they would have a little less. Wow. Just to illustrate. I always thought that was kind of... Uh, I wasn't cynical about it, but I said, well, you know, this in theory is a perfect right. plan, but most 18-year-olds I know don't have $2,000. Again, month, yeah. this is in the 1980s sure. we were talking. Absolutely. Even if you adjust it for inflation, most 18-year-olds, and even if they do, they're buying a car or sure. clothing or app, I, iPhones or whatever. College expenses? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and um, But we used to use, and, and still use to a degree, um, an example of a three-legged stool. Mm-hmm whereby one leg, and of course the visual is you need all three legs, right? Uh So uh, one leg is your social security or any guaranteed pensions. Uh, The other leg is your uh, 401k or retirement uh, monies that you're saving. And the third leg is what we call uh, consumptive spending. It's money you're saving ultimately to spend. For example, saving for a deposit on a house or saving up for a car. Sure. And so when we do financial planning for clients, we sit down with them and we don't say, let's just deal with one leg at a time. We try to make sure the stool is always stable by uh, planning for everything. And uh, I'll also mention that we place a high value on protection. Uh, What I'm fond of saying is you can have the greatest financial plan in the world and accumulate a lot of money, but if you're not protected, and by that I mean life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, health insurance, and legal protection. You don't want to lose all your uh, assets because of a frivolous lawsuit. Or, sure. uh, so uh, protection first. And then uh, the last thing I, I would say uh, along those lines is pay yourself first, which is something I learned from my dad. Sure. Uh, and the, the, the example we used to uh, talk about is if you're in a movie theater and you have... Your dentist, you notice, and your doctor, you notice, and your mm-hmm. mechanic, uh, and so on. And there's a fire, and you're with your wife and children. You don't say, honey, wait here. I'm going to help the dentist. And I'm gonna, you know, Obviously, you help your family first, then you help whoever you can. So right. when it comes to saving, right. you really always want to make sure you pay yourself, then pay everyone else as best you can. And that's the best way to accumulate and plan for your uh, financial future and hopeful well-being. I really appreciate you being here, sure. Rick. You, you're you just a wealth of information. Every time I show up at Master Network, you, I always listen to you because you know so much and you share so much. And I appreciate you sharing so much with my viewers. I, I really to. do. Thank you so much Thank you. for being here. Remember, when you eat well and feel great and select great foods, it's something you want to do for the rest of your life. Remember, balance and moderation is key. And even if you're starting in the beginning, start to save, even if it's a little bit per month. Thank you so much. Thank you to my lovely crew, and have a great night.